Well, let's, let's start at the beginning. Can you remember what it was that first got you interested in movies and got you into the business? Yes, I'd, I'd left school when I was 16, uh, determined somehow to get in the film industry. Now, I had no contacts at all. So I decided to write to quite a few of the studios and I wrote to about half a dozen and I waited and I got a rep the first reply came back and it said, uh, we haven't got anything for you at the moment, but we'll bear your name in mind. And I thought, great, I'm in. Then the next day I got a second letter, then a third letter, then a fourth, and they were all almost the same, in the same tone. So I realized I was being conned. And I was very depressed about this. So um, I, you know, I was living with my parents at the time and uh, my father and mother said, well, why don't you try the smaller studios? So I wrote to the smaller studios and to my delight, I got a call from the chief engineer at Wembley Studios, which I think are still in existence in Middlesex, saying, uh, would I go and see him? Uh, so I got on the train and went to Wembley and he interviewed me and he said, well now look, I can offer you a job, but I can't give you any money. But he said, we can sort of call it a form of apprenticeship. Uh, it can be in the camera department, but he said, I must warn you, we work very long hours. And uh, 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 he also said, um, but if we work late, you'll get one and threepence for your supper, which was what, seven and a half, six and a half P, seven and a half P. Uh, why don't you go home and speak to your parents and see what they say? Well, my mother and father could ill afford me not to. Uh, uh, earn money because they, they had a little news agent to back in this business, that's all, and we lived in the shop. But they, they, they obviously knew I was very keen to do it, so they said, OK, go ahead. And on the following Monday, I started work at the studios. Now, it was made absolutely clear to me I wasn't to touch a camera, film, or anything like that. All I was given was a clapperboard and told what number to put on it and put it in when I was... When, when I was asked to do so and uh, the director was Michael Powell of all people and the producer was a man called Jerry Jackson an American who wore a trilby hat who frightened the life out of me because you know I'd only come from school and, and Mickey throughout his life had a very high-pitched sarcastic voice he always has been like that Chris Chalice will tell you about that because Chris worked with him a lot and um, uh, I started and that first week, they worked till the last train every night, but I didn't care. I got one and threepence, and I caught the last train home, and I was up, and I caught a very early train in the morning, because in those days, if you travelled before half past seven, you could get what they called a workman's ticket. It was a different colour to the other tickets. It was a pink one, and all the normal tickets were green. And if I came home on any time during the day, um, with this ticket, I, I didn't want people to see that it was a pink one because uh, I'd gone up with the workmen. You know, I went up with the plumbers and the bricklayers in the mornings and the, the fishmonger was going to the market um, early in the morning. And, uh, and I started that way. And um, I stayed there for about six or eight months until they closed. And then I was out of work again. And... Um, that I'd learnt about the other studios while I was there. And uh, one of the places they said you, you should try was the old British International Picture Studio at Elstree. So, and they said, don't write, go and try and bushwhack your way in and see the head of the camera department, a, a man called Bill Haggett. So I borrowed my father's car and went over there and uh, I bullied my way in some or other. I, I can't remember what I said. And they also warned me that when you get into his office, he'll be very insulting to you and very rude to you. Well, he, that was the truth. He really was. What did I he say to you? What did he? Well, I mean, he ignored me. You know, he said, uh, what, what, what the hell do you want? So I said, well, I've come for a job, you know. So if you've got a job, as a, what as? I said, as a clapper boy. Oh, I haven't got any jobs uh, of clapper boys at the moment. But they, I was warned, sit there for about an hour. He'll go in and out of the office and he'll see you there and then go home. 
Well, I did that, and I did that about two f fortnightly trips. I went every fortnight. And the third trip, I got the same treatment. What the hell do you want? And I said, well, I've come for a job. I haven't got a job for you. And he, he went in and out of the office several times, and then he came back in, looked on the board and said, I think I might have got something for you. He said, um, picture's called Blossom Time. It's um, uh, directed by a foreigner called Paul Stein, starring Richard Tauber, the very famous singer. And it starts on Monday. He said, two pounds a week. He said, take it or leave it. And I said, all right, I'll take it. And so that's how I got to Elstree. The event, I mean, eventually you graduated into cinematography. What was the attraction of, of the camera? Oh, it, it's inbuilt in me ever since I was at school. My father had a, uh, did his developing and printing of the still camera and daylight printing in the garden. And then we, did, we processed all that in the bathroom. And much to my mother's disgust because she couldn't get in the bathroom while we were, we blacked it all out. And we had the prints washing in the wash basin and the bath had something else in. You couldn't use the bath or anything. So I think that's where it came from. My father also had a little Pathoscope 9.5 millimeter camera. And we used to do little films with that. He'd dress up and I'd operate the camera. And I think that's where it started, really. Uh, it's extraordinary. It just happened. Let's talk about some of your films. Yeah. Of, of, the, of the early days, what, what films really stand out as, 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 as your landmarks? Well, I suppose Blossom... Uh, as, well, I, I was only clapper boy on it, but the one I've mentioned, Blossom Time, is one that comes to mind. Uh, that's really the only one, because I then went back to Wembley and I, I worked my way up through the department as camera assistant and then camera operator. And um, uh, they were quota quickies, the legendary quota quickies. Now, they were made for a, for a pound a foot, as you know. That was the price they got when they made the film. Now, you imagine trying to do a film pound a foot these days, be a joke. And they never ran 90 minutes and they stuck them in the cinemas at 10 o'clock in the morning when the cinemas used to open at that time then and um, uh, to get the quota. And uh, th that's really what happened till the war. And then the war came and I was called up and that's a whole different ball game that. <coughs> so after the war, you, you, you then got into c cinematography at, uh, at some point. Let's talk about some of, some of the big films that, that people will, will, will really know. Um, Sleuth working with two of the greatest actors of our times. What was that like as an experience? Well, now that was interesting. I was lighting by then, as, as you know. Uh, I think the, the, you have to know the story. The story is, it's, there are only two actors in it, although on the credits you see four names, but that's just done to fool you. And Michael Caine had to play two parts in the film. And it was very important that the audience didn't recognise him when he came in the second time, because there's no indication that he is playing those two parts. There's another name on the screen, a fictitious name for this part. And we did the test with Joe Mankiewicz, and they were a bitter disappointment. It, it, there wasn't enough of the disguise in Michael. It was Michael being Michael on the second part. Now, that was going to torpedo the whole picture. And Joe Mankiewicz was very worried about this. And then he had an idea. He said, why don't I get Larry Olivier to come down and read off stage lines to Michael and see if that will inspire him to do something. And that worked. I mean, Michael was a different person then and was in total disguise. And it was that move of Joe's that really made the thing work. I mean, it was quite a remarkable change in Michael then. The director, I mean, for those of us who've not been on a film set, to, to, to what extent is, is the director the, the, the one who's, who's shaping the whole thing? Well, the director's the captain of the ship, there's no doubt about that, and I think the cinematographer's like the first officer. The director makes the film, as we all know. If you like the film, you, you praise the director. If the film looks beautiful, but it's a total bore, you curse the director and... and give credit to the cinematographer. It's as simple as that. But you hope you're not in a situation. You hope it'll be a, a very good story and, and, and look right, you know, be photographed correctly. And um, 
and that's that's the difference really i always reckon i was standing be behind the director while we were making the movie which of the directors you've worked with really earned your respect well there are quite a few i mean john houston i did eight films for john houston he's one uh, carol reed i did three ronnie neem i did six and um uh, there's one other um John here, Carrie, uh, um, God, I can't think of the other one. <coughs> I, I, that'll come to me in a moment. I can't think of the other one. Well, what do you think it is that, that makes a good director? What, 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 are, what are the secrets that these men have got? Uh, making a good director? Yeah. Oh, I think it's um, uh, being able to handle actors and actresses and knowing a good script. It's no good starting a film unless you've got a very good script. So the first thing, the director's got to really believe in the script. And then the, and the second thing is he's got to be able to command the respect of the actors and actresses in the film because, believe you me, they can be a right pain in the butt. Some of them can. Any examples of right pain well, in the butt? Well, the laws of libel stop me, I think, from mentioning names, but uh, there, are, there are quite a few that were just an absolute pain. I mean, some of them have a good side and a bad side on their face. Now, all right, it's no longer with us, but I'll give you an example. Stuart Granger, dear Jimmy Granger, who was a great mate of mine, Jimmy had a good side and a bad side on his face. And the, and the reason was his nose was bent. And if you got on one side, it looked straight. And if you got on the other side, it was bent. And I said to him one day, why have you got a bent nose? And he said, well, that was boxing. Well, I think it was a load of rubbish. I don't think it was that at all. I think he was born that way. But Jimmy would play a scene, and no matter what the director said, he'd wangle it so he got his good side to the camera. And this really got very difficult at one, at one time. And so in the end, we used to go to the de production designer and say, look, Jim is in this scene. For goodness sake, put the door on the side of the set where Jimmy's good side comes into camera. Otherwise, he'll walk in and he'll turn everything round. In the performance, he'll, if he's playing with an actress, he'll turn around somewhere or other. And I mean, you know, this got an absolute pain in the butt. You get that sort of thing, you know. And then you get some of them that um, they, they don't want to be seen in profile because their nose is too long and so... Uh, will you watch me and see that I don't go too much in profile? So there's me behind the director sort of saying, doing this to them, you know, come to turn your face round. Because some directors, a lot of them couldn't care less about the way they look. All they want is performance, really. A classic example also, and a sad example. In my younger days, Myrna Loy was my one of my favourites. She did the Thin Man series with William Powell and the dog Aster. And I remember in the MGM films, Myrna Loy always wore long dresses. And I never thought anything of it. Well, I did a film with Myrna Loy in New York when she was, well, I don't know, in her 70s. And the director didn't care about the way she looked, you know. And I can understand that. Some directors don't. And Myrna Loy had the most terrible legs. They really were. They were very fat calves in her legs. And when she walked away in long shots, she looked awful. And I, I, found I had great problems with that because she relied on me to try and stop her legs being shown. And there's me trying to go the director into tracking in with her instead of letting her walk into a long shot and things like that. And there's an example of, you know, where you can help an actor or an actress uh, with their problems. Let's talk about Oliver because a, a huge success and a, a, a great favourite. Um, what, what do you remember about the making of Oliver? Well, it, it was certainly with Carol Reed, whom I'd worked with before, and I was asked to do it, and I was very thrilled to do that. Now, what do I remember about it? Well, firstly, I must tell you, I operated on David Lean's Oliver Twist. And I photographed Oliver, so I've done the two, the black and white and the colour, both with distinguished directors, David Lean and Carol Reed. Now, when we did Oliver Twist, the Americans objected very much to Fagan's nose, which was played by Alec Guinness. And, you know, we, they put this huge nose onto Alec. And the film 
was banned in America for quite a time. The, the Jewish population, particularly in the film industry, which is, you know, mainly Jewish people, uh, simply wouldn't accept this. So it, it took a long time before Oliver Twist was released in America. Now, when we were doing Oliver, John Wolfe, the producer, said to me, look, you know, when we were doing tests with Ron Moody, he said, what are, you going, are they going to do about the nose? I said, I don't know. You better speak to Carol. Spoke to Carol, and uh, it was agreed that we would leave him as he was and not do the caricatured nose that we did with Alec Guinness. And uh, so that's my first memory, getting over that. My other memory is of the battles that used to go on with Carol and the music department. I wondered why on earth Carol ever decided to do the film uh, when we started it, because he always battled with the Honor White, the choreographer, and Johnny Green, the musical director. And I realized that he did it because he loved working with children. And if you remember, he did a film called The Fallen Idol with a, 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 an actor called Bobby Henry in it. And the boy was wonderful and he's always been very good with children so he really didn't he couldn't care less about the musical numbers and after all they're the most important thing so these battles used to go on and it got so bad that in the end in those days we didn't have a video assist you know we didn't have anything like that I got on to the Samuelson house of Samuelson who rented us the camera and said look can you possibly send a video camera down that we can stick on the top of the blimp, lash it on the blimp so that we can record something on video while we're recording it on film and stop these awful battles going on between Carol and Honor White because Carol would okay a scene, Honor would say, I'm sorry, two of the dancers in row three at the back were out of step and one in row four at the, at the other side was out. Now she's doing her job, I understand that. Carol has the right to veto all that. Now, what Carol should have done, I think, was to have said, OK, we'll go again. Because in the end, Carol has the, the right to select the takes and get a take that Honor was happy with. He didn't have to use it. He could still use the one he liked, but he wouldn't do that. He just battled with it. So we, I said, can we get this video camera from Samuelson's? Sidney Samuelson said, look, we're developing a video assist where it actually comes off the shutter of the camera. Can we bring that down and try that? And they did, they brought it down. And that was the first film that wherever, was, wherever video assist was used. Now all the cameras, professional cameras have this. Directors can see immediately what's going on, but they're still recording it on film. Uh, and, but Oliver was the first one where that happened. And I, I thought, you know, I think that's, quite an interesting landmark in the history of, of British films that happened on that film. As the cinematographer on, on Oliver, what, what were the particular challenges of, of doing a musical like that? Well, when, when you ever start a film like that, the first thing I do is talk to the director. So I spoke to Carol. Carol Reed. Then. Carol Reed, that's right. And said, um, you know, how do you see this film? And he said, I want it to look Dickensian, which meant that I, I was given the freedom to do what I wanted. And uh, I went up to the Hogarth Museum in London to have a look at some of the uh, drawings there and got some ideas. And I decided that the whole of the first part of the film until Oliver is arrested and then goes to Mr. Brownlow's house will be shot in overcast weather. And when he wakes up in the bedroom in Mr. Brownlow's house, which starts the second half of the film after the interval, it will be all sunny. And that's basically what, what we did. And it, it does work. I mean, I've seen the film so many times. It, 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 it transmits in visual terms the boy's feelings. Uh, the son's come out in his life now, and uh, he's, you know, he's very happy. Do you like seeing your films again? Do you, do you go and watch them again? Oh, yes. I've got copies of a lot of them. Um, interesting. Looking back, films I thought I'd done very well. I'm hopelessly disappointed with, and films that I thought were absolutely awful. Some of them I think, well, you know, that's not bad. I, it, it's extraordinary how it changes. But I, I like looking at them and analysing them. 
and you know and some of them I'm pleased with some of them I'm not for Oliver, of course, you got an Oscar nomination. Yes. Did, did you go to the ceremony? No, it go. didn't. Now, I must tell you a story about that. Um, we were um, warned that the ceremony, as you know, takes place during the middle of the night. And we were told it starts at six o'clock in the evening, Californian time, which is two o'clock in the morning, our time. So um, when we went to bed, my wife and I, she had the phone on her side of the bed because I don't want to know about phones at night. I said, look, so that we don't get disturbed, in case anybody phones, let's swap sides of the bed, you see. And we must go to sleep. I said, we mustn't keep awake. Well, we finally did go to sleep. And about, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'll have to start this. I've got the wrong film. Oh, you, Do you mind saying that? No, you? sure. Because, because... Uh, uh, you were about to talk about Fiddler, were you? Yes, Fiddler. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. No, shall we, shall we go back? Yes, talk... okay. I'm sorry about that, yes. Did you go to any of the ceremonies? Yes, uh, I, I, I went to the last one. All right. The Wiz. Oh, okay. Uh, the other two I was working. All right. Well, do, well, well let's have a sort of Oscar section then, and we'll, we'll talk right. about the Oscars. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Yep. Now the Oscars. I mean, you've been nominated twice. Three, three times. Nominated three times and won it once. Yes. Uh, what? What's it like as an experience to be nominated and, and to win an Oscar? Well, in my day, of course, the, the, it was the absolute utopia in awards because the BAFTA awards were not very well regarded in, in those days. Nowadays, it's totally different. The BAFTAs are almost as important as the Oscars, but they weren't in my day. So, it, you know, you're in for the supreme prize, really. It's like uh, racing at Cheltenham, you know, if you win the Cheltenham Gold Cup in, in uh, racing, you, you've got something, same as the Derby and things like that. So it was very important. Um, on Fiddler on the Roof, for example, um, the, when we, we knew it was taking place about two o'clock in the, um, it's, yes, two, it was, starts, it's eight hours, so it starts at six, two o'clock in the morning our time, it starts and I knew roughly that the award for cinematography would be within the first hour, hour and a half, because the thing goes on for about four hours. And um, uh, the phone was on my wife's side of the bed and I said, look, why don't we swap sides while, um, for, just for tonight so that I can answer the phone if it goes. I knew if it went, they weren't going to tell me I hadn't won it. Anyway, so we go to sleep, we're determined to sleep and suddenly the phone rings and we both leap up and we collide in the middle of the bed because I expected to go out my side, she expected to answer the phone and we collided in the middle of the bed, never forget that. And it was Sidney Samuelson on the phone said, Ozzy, congratulations, you've just won the Academy Award. What would that be like? Oh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean. We, we always agreed that we'd open a bottle of champagne if I got it, you know, three or four o'clock in the morning. And that's what we did. And it's amazing to get out of a deep sleep and drink champagne, but it was, it was worth it. And it gives you a whole different aspect on life. I mean, it's absolutely tremendous, particularly for overseas people to get them. It was very difficult for a long time for overseas cameramen to get in. There was a prejudice against them for many, many years in my younger days. In my, in, my, in my younger days, they used to get the, they start with 10 nominations and then they come down to five. And that was done by the cinematographer's branch only. So your peers vote for those, which means an awful lot. The last five, everybody in the Academy votes, actors, actresses, and everything vote cinematography as well. And uh, I often got into the 10. I got into the 10 with Moulin Rouge, but it, it went out on the um, uh, between ten and five. You know, it didn't go that any further than that. But um, no, it's just great to win one. It really is. Did it have any effect on your career? Well, it's that's hard to say. Um, what you mustn't do is get swollen headed and arrogant because that, that, that's no good at all. And I was determined not to do that. I think what I did after that, you tend to forget that. All right, it's in the past now. You're only as good as the next person, and uh, you've got to jolly well earn your keep and, and, and try and get some decent films. So um, 
I try to not let it affect me at all. Some people, sadly, it does go to their head a bit and they become a bit difficult, um, particularly actresses. You know, if you get one that's just got the Academy Award, she thinks the, the aunt, she's the answer to fried bread, you know. And, uh, <laughs> Any names? Oh, no, I'm not going to mention <laughs> names. <laughs> Let's talk about um, some more of your movies. Uh, James Bond, The Man with the Golden Gun, with, with, with Roger Moore. Yeah. What was Roger Moore like to, to work with? Well, Ro I don't know whether he might be saying this, but he was, a, he was the best flat-footed Bond I think there was. I mean, Roger, Roger, if you see Roger running, as you do in The Man with the Golden Gun a lot, I mean, he really is flat, as flat-footed as they make them running. He'll probably curse me for mentioning this, but um, uh, he's, he's very professional. He goes into these fights in the Bond film in a beautiful white shirt. He beats up about God knows how many um, of, the, of the baddies and he comes out with the white shirt looking just as white as it was when he started the fight, you know, and he's left a, a lot of bloody bodies behind. Um, but he, he's very professional, knows his lines, very good technically. You know, you can't fault him on that and, um, and a lovely man, really. really yeah. One, I mean, one of the extraordinary things in the film business is, is how all, most, many of the, the big Hollywood uh, companies and directors use British film crews. What is it about British film crews that makes them so popular? Well, now, I think it's the fact that we have much more artistic freedom over here than they do, and we're brought up in that artistic freedom. I've been to California several times, and I go to the American Society of Cinematographers Clubhouse, and a lot of them hijack me and talk to me about things I've done. And how on earth did you do that? So I tell them how I did it. And they said, well, how did you get permission to do it? So I said, well, why, why? She, they say, well, over here, we wouldn't be allowed to do that. We have to do, make, photograph the picture to an agreed formula by the producers. Now over here, that doesn't apply. We have all the artistic freedom in the world. And I think that that, that entrains the people over here to, to, to be more daring in what they do and uh, don't do the run of the mill work, you know, try something different. But in California, they, they just couldn't do that in my day. They, they were at the studios laid down strict rules as to how the film was to be photographed. And that was it. And they were all photographed the same way. And I found that unless a film gave me a challenge uh, visually, I, I wasn't very keen on doing it. And the, I retired, what people say, quite early in my life. But I did that because I, I was continually getting scripts that I, I thought, well, I've done all this before. And if you, if you get into that rut, the quality of your work drops. The, 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 enthusiasm, the, um, the nervous tension of trying something different just dissipates because there isn't anything different to do. You spoke of relishing challenges. When you look back, which are the challenges that you're most proud of, the challenges that you, you, you met that you're most proud of? Well, really you asked me which are my favourite films. Well, I'm often asked this and I'm going to give you the, the standard answer because, you know, a lot of them I like very much indeed. I did 58, photograph 58 movies, call it 60. The first 20, I struggled. The middle 20, I, I began to experiment. And then the last 20, I really threw the rule book away and did exactly what I wanted. So I suppose, with one or two exceptions, possibly the last 20, must be the more favourite films for me. But, you know, there's a lot of the early ones. I mean, Moulin Rouge comes into the early ones, and I'm very, very proud of that. Not the Baz Luhrmann one, the John Huston one, um, which was a great breakthrough in visual presentation with Technicolor. So uh, that's really it, the last 20. And it, I mean, it, from the outside, it just looks like the most magical career, the most magical way of life. I mean, how do you sum up? your life in film. Well, yeah, I think you've said it for me. It, it, it was quite magical. I was very fortunate to want to go into the film industry. It was tough at the beginning, particularly when you're bringing up a family, because if you stay with a studio under contract, 
even in this country there was a certain discipline with the cinematography nothing like it is in america but there was a certain discipline if you're a freelance you're as good as your last film that's all that's what used to be the saying you're as good as your last film and uh, so you've got to be on your toes and you, you you can't just photograph another film it's you've got to put something extra into it and uh, that's why i stayed a freelance it, from my first film that I photographed, I, I broke away from the studios and uh, became a freelance. And Chris Chalice, whom you've interviewed, was at the same studio with me. We were operators together and he broke away. And I think he, he was a freelance all the time. You've travelled the world. I mean, you've worked in, in many, many countries. You've seen beautiful places. What is it that made you come and settle down here in, in Fontenot Magna? I, I photographed a film, the musical version of Goodbye Mr. Chips, starring Peter O'Toole and Petula Clark. And we searched the country for a school and we couldn't find one and we were getting very desperate. And practically the last school we came to look at was at Sherbourne, which is a town 30 minutes from this house. And that was ideal. And we did the location there. And, and my wife and I took a little bungalow at Tollpuddle the famous place where the martyrs were. And I used to drive from Tollpuddle over the, uh, the downs to Sherbourne every day and f uh, back again. And we vowed and declared that when I retired, we'd move somewhere into Dorset because I had to live near London when I was working to be near the studios. But towards the end, I was doing so many films overseas that didn't apply. And... Um, uh, so we came and we found this house where this interview is being take, uh, made in Fontenot Magna, which is only 30 minutes from Sherbourne. So that really did it. Goodbye, Mr. Chips in Sherbourne. You've been retired for, for some 20 years now. Do you miss the movies? No, not really. Um, I, I still take a very active part in it. Um, um, there is a scholarship in my name uh, and I have a student and part of my duty of that student is to watch him and advise him and help him, which I do absolutely free of charge. He, he's at the Bournemouth at the moment, the one I've got this. They, it's a three-year scholarship and they change it every three years. And he comes to this house and we run my movies or he brings me lighting plans of his, of his project. Do I think he's on the right lines? Things like I do that. I do presentations. Uh, uh, I've done presentation of Taming of the Shrew two or three times uh, for Blanford Film Society for our Village Discussion Club and uh, with clips I use that. Now with the advent of DVD where everything's chapterized I can use sections whereas with film of course you couldn't do that. And in, even with VHS tape you can't, you've got to run them down to the section whereas DVD, one DVD you can because it's chapterized, you can pick out the sections you want. So I do all that. No, I'm very much um, interested in it still. But I enjoy seeing it from the lovely countryside of Dorset. Ozzy Morris, thanks very much. Okay. There's one more thing, which is this, this tip, <coughs> this, this bit of advice to anyone, because you can get it. Yes. I'm, I'm hoping to get the, the three of you yes. into a minute. And I oh, think you'll, get, you'll get my bit in quite quickly. Oh, you right. run about 15 seconds. All right. So, yeah. okay. All right. Um, th just one final thing. Many, many people these days are picking up their own cameras, buying the cheap DVs and, and, and uh, video cameras. Um, if you had one piece of advice to someone just starting out making home movies, what would it be? Well, it's very simple. Keep the camera very steady pan slowly left or right and tilt up and down very slowly and don't worry about the fact that you're using up a lot of film as it was in the old days uh, just keep the camera movements very slow and very steady simple as that